and numeracy award for literacy. Order. It being 2 p.m., the time for members' statements has expired. The Honourable the Prime Minister. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I inform the House that the Treasurer will be absent from question time today, and for the remainder of the week, he is travelling to South Korea to attend the APEC Finance Minister's meeting and to Indonesia for bilateral meetings. In his absence, I will answer questions on his behalf. The Honourable on the Leader of the Opposition. We've got petrol prices going through the roof. We've got foreign debt up no. to five hundred billion. The We're Leader of the Opposition. The leader of the Opposition their, resume uh, his seat. Leader of the Opposition resume his seat. The Honourable the Prime Minister. Um, Mr uh, uh, Speaker, can I um, seek the indulgence of the House? Uh, say something that is properly available for indulgence, Mr Speaker, and that is on behalf of the parliament to convey to uh, the people of the United States of America our profound sympathy on the terrible devastation and apparently very large loss of life occasioned by Hurricane Katrina in the Gulf Coast region of the United States. I have already personally conveyed to President Bush uh, my concern and sympathy and that I know of all Australians for these events. Uh, the Hurricane Katrina is a terrible reminder of the uh, capricious uh, damage that can be done uh, by natural disasters. Uh, it's a reminder that even uh, the most powerful nation on earth, uh, Mr Speaker, um, can be ravaged uh, by these um, natural catastrophes. As the House will be aware, the government has already made a donation of $10 million to the American Red Cross. In addition, as an immediate first step, uh, an advance party of uh, two to three people to be shortly followed by some 15 more emergency disaster experts have gone to the United States and they are available uh, to assist the American authorities uh, in relation to any assistance that might be required over the weeks and the months ahead. Uh, we have also indicated that we are prepared to offer the American authorities additional experts to help provide emergency assistance on the ground. Mr Speaker, um, this uh, does represent a terrible natural disaster. The exact loss of life is yet to be uh, known, but it could run into thousands, if not tens of thousands. Uh, it's very easy uh, from a distance for people to cast judgments about the adequacy of the response or otherwise, and uh, what is uh, properly called the blame game is already fully underway within the United States. I don't seek uh, in any way to enter that debate, Mr Speaker. I do, however, uh, want to say on behalf of the government that uh, we greatly appreciate the efforts of Australian consular officials in the United States. There has been criticism of them. I think that criticism on the basis of the facts known to me is unfair. Having said that, I do understand fully the anxiety and the anguish of families uh, who are out of contact with loved ones in situations of apprehended danger or violence, and their reaction is totally natural, totally human and totally to be expected. But Mr Speaker, uh, the Foreign Minister will no doubt have something further to say about this matter uh, either in question time or later today, but I do understand that this morning Australian consular officials or one consular official uh, was allowed to enter New, New Orleans. I understand there are some <coughs> 15 to 20 Australians uh, in the affected area, of which uh, there are concerns held for two, uh, Mr Speaker, and uh, every effort um, is being made in cooperation with the American authorities to render assistance. I do want to record the thanks uh, of the government uh, to those members of Australian press uh, organisations who assisted and facilitated uh, assistance to Australians. Mr Speaker, the situation, as I am advised, was that whilst access uh, of consular officials was denied by the United States authorities to all countries, uh, Australia included, uh, no attempt was made to prevent press uh, people from entering the affected region for reasons I think that will be apparent on a moment's reflection. Any attempt to ban the press from this disaster region would no doubt have provoked in a country such as the United States and indeed in Australia an enormous amount of adverse comment and criticism. Mr. Speaker. Can I conclude my remarks by saying that we hope that 
the remaining 15 to 20 Australians are safe and sound, and that the particular fears entertained in relation to two of our citizens, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, are not uh, realised. And can I wish uh, again uh, to the people of the United States uh, uh, our great condolence, our sympathy, our desire to help and uh, our desire to participate in rebuilding the shattered region. As I said in my uh, message to President Bush, I have no doubt that the American spirit will ensure the rebuilding of New Orleans and that the difficulties of recent days uh, will, uh, Mr Speaker, recede as the process of rebuilding and renewal in those affected areas proceeds. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Uh, I seek your indulgence, Mr Speaker, to speak on the same matters. Uh, Mr Speaker, Hurricane Katrina has wreaked havoc on New Orleans and large parts of the southern United States, and it's a natural tragedy of truly mammoth proportions. I think the hearts of all Australians have been touched by the plaintive sights of those mothers holding up their babies, uh, families bereft looking for other family members as they confront the most dreadful personal crises in the most dreadful possible circumstances. It's a scene that we've come, unfortunately, all too accustomed to, to seeing in areas of the globe less well resourced than the United States. And to all those situations, the United States has always responded positively with great assistance and with alacrity. Now the United States finds itself in the same circumstances, and I think it behoves all of us to respond with the same level of generosity and the same level of alacrity. Therefore, we support the $10 million uh, initial uh, uh, contribution that the government has made to the Red Cross Society in the United States. We note that uh, President Bush has appointed his uh, father, the previous President Bush, and former President Bill Clinton to head up a private uh, aid donor effort, and uh, I would all urge all Australians uh, to make a contribution to that uh, to uh, show our appreciation in the past of the generosity of individual Americans and American governments in situations of national tragedy elsewhere, and to show in contemporary terms the concerns that we all feel for the families that are suffering, suffering so greatly now and will suffer for some considerable period of time. These tragic situations bring out the best and worst in people. There is no doubt about that. And I'd want to also pay tribute to those with very little resources, those members of uh, American emergency services and individuals who took up early the effort to try to sustain law and order, to try to sustain movement of aid to people who were suffering. There are some very brave policemen in the United States, and there are some very brave individuals who, in the worst of poss all possible circumstances and at considerable risk to their own lives, tried to bring into the, uh, this fraught situation a sense of order. And our admiration ought to be extended to them. I want to extend that admiration too to young Australians who found themselves in, caught up in this dreadful situation. I'm pleased to hear from the Prime Minister that those numbers are now down to 15 to 20. The last briefing we had that they were at 40. And, and like him, the opposition holds, uh, very, uh, very, uh, joins him in, uh, in expressing hopes that those uh, two that have definitely not been accounted for uh, turn up safe and sound. But we've just seen, as Australians, examples of teams of young Australians banding together to survive, to survive in an urban environment wrecked by floods and an absence of the rule of law. And I want to pay tribute to those young Australians who protected each other, bonding together to get through a crisis even though they were not familiar with each other before that crisis began. It seems in the sea of chaos that descended, these men and women found in each other the will and the strength to survive, and they are to be commended. Personally, I am unhappy with the response that we have made in consular terms to this point of time. Though there appears to be a situation where we have uh, caught up somewhat during the course of the last 24 hours. Frankly, the response has not been good enough. Now, it is true that the United States has uh, said, and understandably so, 
They didn't want to find themselves tripping over diplomats and consular officials as they went about the task of reorganising or organising their aid effort. It's an entirely sensible thing for the Americans and the American president, with tens of thousands of casualties on his hand and a completely wrecked situation, but he doesn't pay mind to what might be going on with 60 or 70 Australians in that situation. It isn't his job, nor is it the job of his officials. It's the job of Australians. And it was the case that, uh, when placed in that situation, members of the media, with very little resources uh, to hand for themselves, were able to do an effective consular job, and our thanks ought to be extended to them on behalf of those Australians who have nothing but praise for them in the comments that we have seen so far for the work that they are able to do. Now, we have the biggest embassy uh, anywhere on earth in the United States, and we have numerous other Australians attached to various American activities, and many of them are service personnel, and all of them are resourceful and used to hopping on helicopters in the worst of all possible circumstances and doing the job. And quite frankly, I think they should have been called on a little earlier than they were. That having been said, uh, that's uh, a comment which I think is entirely legitimate in the circumstances. Let me go again to saying to those Australians who did so well, who did so well on uh, ensuring that uh, they protected their fellow citizens in the worst of possible circumstances. You have shown individual initiative, courage and mateship, thoroughly in keeping with the Australian spirit, and you did us proud. To the United States, uh, we want to say this. We sympathise completely with you in this hour of your anguish and suffering. We sympathise completely with the people who have found themselves without homes, without family members, and uh, with their lives in absolute chaos. We know at the end of the day the great generosity that uh, moves the heart of the American spirit will see that everybody is taken care of, that everybody is nurtured, that everybody has a chance to go through their grieving with the nation behind them. It's important as the Americans go about the way in which they usually handle these things with that generosity of spirit to themselves that there are others who share that view with them and who will be watching with uh, all the supportive sentiment, uh, to, uh, sentiment uh, uh, capable of being mounted as they go through the, with the processes of, uh, of, uh, of settling down the nation and getting over their grieving. Questions? Are there any questions? The Honourable the Leader of the Opposition. Yes, my question is to the Prime Minister. I refer the Prime Minister to the statement made today by Brisbane woman Fiona Seidel, who is stranded in New Orleans following the Hurricane Katrina disaster. When asked what message she has for the Prime Minister, Ms Seidel said, I am a good Australian, I pay my taxes, I work, I own a home. I do the right thing, I don't commit crimes. And he pretty much wasn't there for me when I needed him. Why wasn't the Prime Minister and the Australian government there helping when Fiona and others like her were trapped in New Orleans with no way out. The Honourable the Prime Minister. Order. Well, Mr. Uh, Mr. Speaker. Um... Order. Panic. Order. Panic. Order. The Prime Minister has the call. Uh, Mr. Uh, Speaker, can uh, can I first say uh, through you? Can I first, uh, Mr. Speaker, say uh, through you? Uh, to um, not only the Leader of the Opposition but also to the lady in question that um, I can fully understand why she would say that. Uh, I can. I can fully understand anybody um, caught, caught in that situation, Mr Speaker, anybody who had a son or a daughter, any other relative or friend uh, in an apparently very dangerous situation that would feel that way. And uh, if uh, she feels, Mr Speaker, uh, that the government has in some way failed her, then I apologise to her, Mr Speaker, uh, because um, uh, we never like to fail those um, who we are charged to represent. But if she feels that way, then uh, of course that's how she feels, and I don't seek in any way to um, uh, avoid responsibility. But can I say that her criticism, however understood, and whoever uh, well-intentioned is um, misplaced and, for reasons I will try to explain, unfair. 
uh, Mr. Speaker. It is the case that when a disaster of this magnitude occurs, the only way it can be fairly handled and properly handled and efficiently handled and safely handled is for it to be handled by the domestic authority. The idea that you could have the military personnel of a range of foreign countries operating independently within the United States to rescue their own foreign nationals is a recipe, Mr. Speaker, for chaos and potentially for bloodshed. Particularly in a society, Mr. Speaker, particularly in a society which has a far more. Now, look, I, I, I listen carefully. I mean, this is a, this is quite a serious issue, Mr. Speaker, and, and I am and I am going to deal with it in a serious Order. manner, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the, the, the reality is, the reality is that the, the to, for anybody to suggest that the military forces of this country, as guests in another country, could operate in some independent way, Mr. Speaker, inside that country to rescue our nationals, without accepting, of course, that the military forces of Great Britain, of Canada, of Mexico, of Nicaragua and a whole range of other countries that also have personnel in the United States. And the Leader of the Opposition talked about tripping over diplomats, Mr Speaker. Tripping over uh, diplomats would be chicken feed to tripping over the armies of several other countries, Mr Speaker, if the advice of the Leader of the Opposition had been followed. So, Mr Speaker, can I, can I simply, but can I also Order. say, can I also say, Mr. Speaker, Order. that the leader of the opposition, the leader of the opposition on this occasion, has succumbed to a piece of cheap populism, Mr. Speaker. It is nothing more. It is nothing more than now. now if, if you doubt, if you doubt, Order. Uh, Mr. Speaker, if you doubt, if you doubt that, Mr. Speaker, can I refer you to some remarks made by the member for Griffiths, Mr. Speaker? speaking on Sky TV only yesterday, and this is what he had to say. This is what he had to say yesterday, Mr Speaker. To be fair to the government and to Mr Downer, I think their hands are tied at the moment by the United States authorities, which for so long now have not allowed Australian consular officials access to the disaster-affected areas. Mr Speaker, can I say that again? I think they had. Oh, that is yesterday. Oh, that's yesterday. Yes, yes, Order. yes. He said Order. it all, Mr. Speaker. That is yesterday. Order. You know what's happened? They they turned on the radio this morning. They heard a bit of talk back, and they thought, "Gee, we can score a cheap political point on this." And, and that is that is what the leader of the opposition did. That is what we know exactly. Order. That's what the leader of the opposition did. I don't blame Mr. Speaker. I don't blame any of the people. I don't blame the lady quoted, and as I say again, I say again quite unconditionally, if that lady thinks I let her down, then I say to that lady, I am sorry. I have, I have tried in the nine and a half years I've been Prime Minister never to let an Australian down, Mr. Speaker. And, and if any Australian thinks I've let them down, they will always receive an expression of apology and regret from me. But I have to say, Mr. Speaker, I have to say on behalf of the, of the officials Order. of the Department of Foreign Affairs that I think the criticism that's been made of them is unfair, Mr Speaker. I think the criticism made of them is unfair. Uh, I think the criticism is unfair. And of course I say again, that was the view of the member for Griffiths when he was in Mr Responsible mode yesterday, but a day later he's in Mr Populist mode. And he thinks he can score a cheap political point, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I think that uh, the Australian people will understand it. Some Order. will be critical of me, some will not. That has always been the case. It always will be the case, Mr. Speaker. But can I say to that lady, uh, I understand how she feels, Mr. Speaker. But can I say to her, it is not fair to blame the efforts of the consular officials. It is not fair to blame uh, the, uh, the behaviour of the government. We did what we could in the circumstances, Mr. Speaker, and I think the attempt by the leader of the opposition to make a bit of political mileage out of this is absolutely pathetic. The honourable member for Cook. Exactly right. Uh, thanks very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is addressed to the Prime Minister. Uh, would the Prime Minister inform the House of any recent analysis of the financial position of Australian families? 
The Honourable the Prime Minister. Yeah, Mr Speaker, I thank the, uh, the member for uh, Cook for his question. And, and might I say, Mr Speaker, uh, last week I visited uh, the electorate of the member for Cook and I attended a function in company with the member for Cook and the member for Hughes. And the member for Cook reminded me when I was there, Mr Speaker, he didn't remind me about the performance of certain football teams, Mr Speaker, but he did remind me about, he did remind me, Mr Speaker, that unemployment in the Sutherland Shire has now reached an amazing low of about 2.3 per cent, Mr Speaker. And it's, a, and it's an example of the way in which the families of Sydney, in company with the families of all Australian cities, have prospered under this government. Mr Speaker, I can inform the member for Cook that last week the Treasury released its analysis on the tax position of a range of Australian families, Mr Speaker. And was that not fascinating reading, Mr Speaker? It showed that when you model 20 family types from young to old, varying income levels, singles and couples, with or without children, it found, Mr Speaker, that all family types modelled are estimated to have experienced an increase in real disposable income of between 12.7 per cent and 29.5 per cent, Mr Speaker, between 1996 and projected into 2006. In other words, Mr Speaker, every single family type that was modelled had enjoyed a massive real increase in their disposable income, Mr Speaker. Now, this, of course, is a consequence not only of the general strength of the Australian economy, but it is also specifically a consequence of the family tax benefit system, which has been introduced by this government and is clearly in the gun sights of the member for Rankin, Mr Speaker, and also the member for Lilly, both of whom over the last two weeks have begun to gnaw away at the family tax benefit system, have begun to talk darkly about and glibly, Mr Speaker, about middle class welfare, which is code, Mr Speaker, for introducing an income test on average Australian families, Mr Speaker. That's what that's code for. But let me go back to the Treasury analysis. I shouldn't allow the member for Lilly and the member for Rankin to distract me, Mr Speaker. Let me go back, let me go back to the Treasury analysis, Mr Speaker. Order. What it showed, amongst other things, that a single income Order. couple on an average wage with two children will have, have increased, Mr Speaker, that their real disposable income will have increased by 29.5 per cent from 38,000 to 49,000 that a single person on an average a wage will have increased by 21 per cent. Senior Australians will have also substantially increased by between 12.7 per cent and 27.8 per cent. Mr Speaker, the Treasury paper also calculated that the, next, the net tax threshold for the 20 family types and the net tax threshold is the income point at which personal income tax paid exceeds Order. cash benefits received. But in 2005-06, uh, Mr. Speaker, an estimated 38% of all families will receive more cash benefits than they pay in personal tax, Mr. Speaker. And the story in that department is even better for larger families. 59% of families with three or more children Order. aged under 16 pay no net tax, Mr. Speaker. No tax in net terms, Mr. Speaker. Now this analysis which is of government policy over the last nine and a half years, is in stark contrast to the alternative offered by the Australian Labor Party. Mr. Speaker. The policy taken by Labor to the last election proposed the abolition of the government's $600 a child uh, payment, Mr. Speaker, payments that hundreds of thousands of families all around the country are receiving at this very moment, Mr. Speaker, and also under Labor's election policy parents were punished by up to $2,000 a year if they chose to stay at home and look after their children. What this Treasury analysis does Mr. Speaker, is to demonstrate that the Order. greatest winners under this government have been the low and middle income families of Australia, and this government is immensely proud of that achievement. The Hon. Member for Griffith. Thanks very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Foreign Minister. I refer to statements made today by Mr Peter McNeill concerning his son John, who, together with other Australians, had been trapped in New Orleans for some days. 
Minister, is it true that when Senator Ron Boswell contacted Minister Downer's staff seeking assistance, one of your staff hung up on Senator Boswell? Minister, is it also true that when the McNeils contacted the minister's office, and I quote Mr McNeil, his staff just were not interested in helping us one iota, then they told us just to ring a 1800 number, and that was it. They hung up on us. The Honourable Minister of Foreign Affairs. Uh, Mr. Speaker, well, first of all, I, uh, Mr. Speaker, I thank the honourable member for his question. Uh, Mr. Speaker, um, my office has received, and my department has received, hundreds, probably thousands, of calls. And uh, during a, a crisis like this, can I just say, Mr. Speaker, I admire the incredible patience, perseverance, and hard work they put in. I'm, I'm sorry it might not suit the Order. opposition. I Order. think they do an absolutely outstanding job. It is incredibly stressful for those in the opposition who haven't yet had the privilege of being in government. I think they would, uh, un that those who have would understand that in a situation like this it, it is extremely difficult. And, uh, Mr Speaker, I can only speak with great admiration for the work they've done. Uh, in terms of Senator Boswell, he issued a statement today, and I'll, I'll table that if the honourable member wishes. But can I also say that um, I'm delighted that uh, John McNeil, Mr McNeil's son, is now safe and he's been evacuated from New Orleans. And on Brisbane Radio this morning, his mother, John's mother, Mary order, McNeil— order. The minister will um, seat. The member for Griffith on a point of order. Uh, Mr Speaker, on relevance, I asked whether the minister's staff the, hung up on the, the McNeils. Me he hasn't answered that. Seat. The minister is in order. Personally, I'd be pretty tempted to hang up on you, um, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mrs. McNeil. Uh, oh yes, yeah, we'll come back to you Order. a little later, Mrs. McNeil. Uh, Mr. Speaker. Order. The minister has the call. Honourable members of the opposition might be interested to know uh, that John's mother, Mary McNeil, said on Brisbane Radio um, this morning. I tried to explain the other night about the problem that the Australian government have had getting in, and they've only been aware of one side of the ledger. She went on to say, so now they do realise that the American government have stopped our people getting in there. I think the point here is, Mr Speaker, as the Prime Minister said, that uh, I think the, the point here, Mr Speaker, is that um, I think those who were trapped in New Orleans were unaware, understandably unaware, that our consular officials weren't able to get in. And it's also understandable they became upset and frustrated. So, um, Mr Speaker, I think uh, people now better understand the situation of what was possible and what was not possible, and in this particular instance we're delighted that John McNeill is safe and sound. The Honourable Member for Pearce. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is directed to the Minister for Foreign Affairs. Would the Minister update the House on the situation of those Australians caught in Hurricane Katrina in the United States, and what is the government's uh, response to this crisis? The Honourable Minister of Foreign Affairs. Um, Mr Order. Speaker, first of all, um, can I say to the Honourable Member, I appreciate her interest and her serious interest in this terrible issue. Um, Mr Speaker, um, as the Prime Minister has covered some of this ground already, I'll be brief, but let me say that, thankfully, there are no reports of Australians um, who, who have been killed or seriously injured at this stage. Though we do remain concerned about two people. One of them is a 75-year-old dual national who's lived for a long time in the United States who lives near New Orleans, and the other a 30-year-old Victorian man who, scheduled, who was scheduled to be in a hotel in New Orleans when the hurricane hit, um, and uh, the consular officer who's managed to get into New Orleans has had the opportunity of going to the hotel, but um, the hotel was uh, apparently undamaged but locked, closed, and uh, we have not yet been able to track the 30-year-old Victorian man. Um, Mr Speaker, on that point, I um, should also add that uh, we know of around 15 Australians now, choose my words very carefully here, who may still be in the affected area. That's not to say they are. But they may be. Now, a lot of these people are people who have been permanent residents of 
New Orleans and uh, surrounding districts. Um, those people may be awaiting evacuation or they, um, or they may not. But, um, Mr Speaker, let me make this point. Um, we are pleased that eventually an Australian consular officer who invited a, Br a British consular officer to join him became the first consular officer from any country to enter New Orleans and to look for uh, stranded Australians. And he followed up on the information about Australians who might be in the area. Um, Mr Speaker, there has been, as the Prime Minister has pointed out, some comment that consular and military staff should have been sent into New Orleans uh, sooner. We need to understand that we are unfortunately constrained um, by uh, the laws and the rules of a foreign country, this time the United States of America. And we would expect Australian consular officers, uh, as does the British government, the Canadian government, the Mexican government and all other governments, to adhere to local laws and the advice of local authorities when they are in a foreign country. And uh, what is more, Mr Speaker, we certainly wouldn't want to put more Australians into a position of danger by flouting local laws. Um, I think, Mr Speaker, our ambassador, our staff at the embassy in Washington have done a simply uh, outstanding job, and I'd like to uh, express my admiration for the endless hours of work our consular staff have been doing in Baton Rouge, in Houston, San Antonio, Dallas and elsewhere. Um, they have worked tirelessly day and night. And the Prime Minister quoted the opposition spokesman earlier, and I uh, won't read the quote again, but we appreciated up until today the support of the opposition. The Leader of the Opposition put out a press release on Friday saying the Australian Labor Party will support any assistance the government seeks to provide to the people of New Orleans and surrounding areas. And, Mr Speaker, I think in a, tra in a tragic situation like this, um, none of us should trade on misery. And, Mr. Speaker, I think it's a sad, it's a sad thing. That's all I think. It's a sad thing um, that the Labor Party has decided uh, that this most appalling of tragedies is today, on the 5th of uh, September, worthy of party political debate. I must confess, Mr. Speaker, enthusiastic as I often am about party political debate, I don't happen to agree with that political judgment. And I think that will do the Leader of the Opposition a good deal of Order. damage with the Australian people. Yeah, yeah. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. My question is to the Prime Minister. Prime Minister, is it a fact that the 11 Australians trapped in the New Orleans Superdome were eventually evacuated from New Orleans by a Channel 9 crew? Having reached Dallas, was accommodation for Australians there also organised and paid for by Channel 10? Did Channel 10 also purchase clothes for Australian victims of Hurricane Katrina? Prime Minister, while media organisations were providing assistance in rescuing Australians, where was the government? The Honourable Prime Minister. Well, Mr. Mr Speaker, um, uh, it, is, it is my understanding that um, uh, a number of Australians were assisted uh, out of the area in New Orleans uh, by uh, I think two of the channels as to whether, having got to Texas, uh, some of those expenses were paid by another channel. I, I'm not personally aware of that, but uh, if the Leader of the Opposition asserts it, I, I won't argue the toss with him. Mr Speaker, um, uh, the Leader of the Opposition continues to make the point, and uh, he's chosen to uh, uh, have a go at the government. That's his right. I can simply say to him that, uh, given, given that we must observe the laws, Mr Speaker, given that we must observe the laws of, of countries in which we operate, and given, I'm sure, Mr Speaker, that <clears throat> Australians, if um, a similar disaster were to befall this country, Australians would not appreciate Americans in this country taking the law into their own hands in order to save their nationals, Mr Speaker. Order. I don't believe order. I don't believe for a moment. But I, I'm no, now I'm referring, Mr. Speaker, to the proposition advanced by the Leader of the Opposition that Australian military personnel should have commandeered helicopters 
Mr. Speaker. In order, Mr. Speaker, you said it today. Order. <laughs> you order. Have, the leader of the opposition says, "Where did he say that?" He ought to have a look at the transcript of his press conference, Mr. Speaker. Yeah, yeah, Mr. Speaker, he ought to have. He ought to have a look at what he said. I noticed in his indulgence he retreated a bit. Mr. Order, Speaker. order. The Prime Minister is in his seat. The Leader of the Opposition on a point of order. I'll take a point of order on relevance. Is it relevant for the Prime Minister to accuse me of saying something I have the never leader said? The opposition resume his seat. Dear heli leader of the Opposition resume his seat. The Leader of the Opposition is well aware. The Leader of the Opposition is well aware there are forms of the House in which he may wish to correct a statement later. The Honourable the Prime Minister. I, I stand by what I've said, uh, Mr Speaker. Uh, I think what the Leader of the Opposition has done in this is, is really, Mr Speaker, a, a very, very uh, unwise thing. I can understand that Australians who have been caught up are, are, are concerned, and I have already said, Mr Speaker, that um, if any Australian feels that the government let them down. I regret that, Mr. Speaker, and I've said that repeatedly, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I, I don't believe that they have been let down when you take all of the circumstances into account. As the member for Griffith was fair and generous enough to acknowledge 24 hours ago, our hands were tied by the fact that the American authorities would not allow consular people to go in. Now, the member for Griffith, who's had a little more experience in this than the Leader of the Opposition. He acknowledged that yesterday. Now, in the 24 hours that have gone by, the Opposition has made a tactical decision that they can get some political mileage out of this, Mr Speaker. That is exactly what they've done. It's as transparent and as weak as that, Mr Speaker, and the attack by the Leader of the Opposition is as insubstantial Order. as that. And I agree with the observation made by the, by the uh, Minister for Foreign Affairs about the Leader of the Opposition's motives. The Honourable Member for Tangney. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is addressed to the Attorney General. Given the tragic events that have occurred in the United States, would the Attorney General advise the House what expertise the Australian government is ready to provide to the United States to assist with dealing with the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina? Yeah, good the Honourable the Attorney General. Speaker, I thank the Honourable Member for Tangney for his question because, uh, like him, uh, all Australians are very interested in what we are doing to assist where we have the capacity to do so. And uh, three experienced emergency managers from Emergency Management Australia, uh, an organisation within my department, are, as I speak, um, travelling to the United States to assess what expertise we can offer for that recovery process in the wake of Hurricane Katrina. The team brings experience in community capacity building, the social consequences of disaster and a detailed appreciation of international disaster coordination arrangements. And in particular, the team will share its experience in developing disaster assessment strategies identifying areas of high community risk, such as public health, accommodation and transport issues, prioritising community needs, such as shelter, food, water, electricity and safety, and uh, structuring a coordinated community response. Uh, EMA Australia has recent and very significant experience, uh, such as responding to the Indian Ocean and tsunami, uh, major cyclones, as we've seen, impacting upon the Northern Territory as well as elsewhere, uh, and devastating several specific nations, and most recently um, the uh, forest fires in Sumatra. They have strong links with the United States Emergency Management Agency, FEMA, which is leading the United States' response to this disaster. I met recently with some of its senior officials when I visited the United States in July, I know they understand the importance of an all-hazards approach to emergency management, ranging from terrorist attacks to natural disasters, and of course that has taken on additional significance in the light of these recent tragic events. Mr Speaker, like all Australians, having watched the devastated footage from New Orleans, I'm pleased that we are in a position to offer expert assistance to the United States at this time. And I might say, uh, like the Leader of the Opposition, I'm glad of the, 
the support that Australians are giving, and I might add a little additional information, because the uh, Red Cross, which is coordinating support for the victims of Hurricane Katrina, uh, can be contacted. Uh, they can be reached on their website, www.redcross.org.au. Um, or on an 1800 number, 1800 811 700. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. My further question is to the uh, Prime Minister on these matters, and I refer to the fact that until today the Foreign Minister had failed to persuade the United States Government to allow Australian consular officials access to New Orleans. Prime Minister, why is it that the Government has failed to have any effect on its counterparts in Washington? After nine long years of telling Australians that the Howard government has unprecedented access and influence with the government of the United States, why is it that the Howard government has failed when Australian citizens need help in America most? The Honourable the Prime Minister. Well, Mr. Uh, Speaker, the government has not failed its citizens. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, the government has not failed its citizens. Order. Mr. Speaker, what, uh, what, Mr. Speaker? Uh, occurred in this particular case was that a decision was taken by the United States government not to allow consular officials from any country. And if, in fact, Mr. Speaker, the leader of the opposition is saying that we have failed, then he's saying that Tony Blair has failed. He's saying that the Canadian Prime Minister has failed. The leader of the opposition is engaging in cheap populism. The honourable member for Maranoa. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is addressed to the Deputy Prime Minister and Minister for Trade. Would the Deputy Prime Minister and Minister for Trade inform the House of Australia's recent export performance, and would he also advise the House how is this government's sound economic management contributing to this export success? The Honourable the Deputy Prime Minister and Minister for Trade. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Member for Maranoa for his question. And, uh, the member for Maranoa, as all members would be aware, that uh, last week uh, the ABS figures for Australia's international trade and good in goods and services for the month of July uh, was released last week, and that indicated that uh, in July uh, exports of goods and services rose by 2 per cent to achieve uh, an all-time record monthly uh, figure of $15 billion worth of exports of goods and services. And of course, uh, there's been significant increases and record highs in both. Uh, value and volume terms in 2004-05, uh, and that was achieved again in the month of uh, July. And of course, it's right across the economy. And of course, the member for Maranoa's own electorate contributes significantly to that in terms of uh, the beef exports and a lot of the resource exports that go out of the electorate of uh, Maranoa, out of Queensland, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Speaker. But of course, uh, the government has worked hard over the last nine years to create a solid economic platform in Australia through sound economic management that uh, has delivered a very competitive circumstance to Australia's exporters of both goods and services. Order. Now, interestingly, those statistics uh, uh, show that Australia's exports rose in all sectors, Mr Speaker, not just the resource sector, but in all sectors. In all sectors. Now, now the, uh, the member interject, he might just listen the to the statistics. He might just listen to the statistics, Mr Speaker. Because in those ABS figures, uh, where all sectors increased uh, in the non-rural and other goods area, and that includes the resources sector, our exports rose by 3 per cent. In the manufacturing sector, in the manufacturing sector, Mr. Speaker, in the manufacturing sector, uh, Mr. Speaker, exports rose by 2.1 per cent. In the rural exports, they rose by 1 per cent. By 1 per cent in the rural export area and services also rose by 1 per cent, Mr Speaker. So I know that that uh, has impressed the members of the Labor Party, uh, that all sectors of the export community have increased uh, their capacity. But it's important that we should also note, Mr Speaker, some of the rationale behind this. And of course, it's been this government's sound economic management over the last nine or so years that have delivered a set of circumstances in Australia uh, that have created us uh, a circumstance that is increasingly Competitively, increasingly competitive and super efficient, Mr. Speaker. That economic management that's delivered low interest rates, low unemployment, low inflation, budget surpluses, we gave it to them. I mean, they're interjecting. We gave it to them. Hey? We, go, we gave it to them. Order. <coughs> surplus Order. budgets. When did, you, when did the Labor Order. Party ever produce a surplus budget? 
Mr Speaker, that what they did give us, what you did give us, what the Labor Party did give us, was $96 billion worth of debt. Uh, and Mr Speaker, it's something else this government has also done, is paid Order. off Labor's $96 Order. billion dollars worth of debt. So, Mr Speaker, if you look at those economic fundamentals that have developed in this country under the leadership of the coalition government, it's created an incredibly strong platform, a competitive platform, an efficient platform for Australia's exporters to compete on the world stage and increase what they're selling to the world. The Honourable Member for Lilly. My question is to the Prime Minister. Is the Prime Minister aware of the member for Wentworth's response to the Treasurer's mockery of his tax proposals, saying on 2GB on August 30 that the Treasurer's attacks on his tax proposal was, and I quote, slick and of no substance? Does the Prime Minister agree with the member for Wentworth? The Honourable the Prime Minister. Uh, Mr uh, Speaker, I think the member for Wentworth is an excellent addition to this parliament. Yeah. And uh, I thank the uh, member for Wentworth for the contribution he has made to the debate. And uh, I think the member for Higgins, Mr Speaker, Order. Mr. Speaker Order. I, think, I think the member for Higgins is the best treasurer this country's ever had. Yeah. The Honourable Member for Braddon. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is addressed to the Minister for Health and Ageing. Would the Minister update the House on the latest GP bulk billing figures? The Honourable Minister for Health and Ageing. Well, Mr Speaker, I, uh, I do thank the member for Braddon for Order. his question, and Mr Speaker, I can understand why he's interested in this topic, because Mr Speaker, the bulk billing rate, the bulk billing rate in the electorate of Braddon, has increased by almost 20 per cent, 20 percentage points uh, over the last 12 months. And Mr Speaker, I should point out that bulk billing is not the be-all and end-all of Medicare. But it is important and it should be widely available, particularly to pensioners uh, and children under 16. And thanks to the policies of the Howard government, the national GP bulk billing rate was almost 75 per cent in the June quarter. That's three out of four visits to the GP were bulk billed. And Mr Speaker, that's up from just two in three GP visits that were bulk billed in October 2003. I can inform the House, Mr Speaker, that at 82 per cent, the bulk billing rate for children is at an all-time high. At 69 per cent, the bulk billing rate in country areas is at an all-time high, and it's up 16 percentage points uh, on December 2003. Now, Mr Speaker, the member for Lawler likes to talk down our Medicare system. Uh, she likes to say that uh, increases in bulk billing rates are unsustainable. I can inform the House that the bulk billing rate in the electorate of Lawler is up 8 per cent over the last 12 months, and I look forward to her press release, her press release saying that the Howard government is truly the best friend that Medicare has ever had. The Honourable the Manager of Opposition Business. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And my question is to the Minister for Health and Ageing. Can the Minister confirm that, in his capacity as Minister for Health, he attended a fundraiser with health industry representatives in Sydney on Wednesday, the 31st of August 2005. At that function, which took place just 12 hours after the former New South Wales opposition leader attempted to take his own life, can the minister confirm that he made the following remark in response to a policy suggestion? And I quote: "If we did that, we would be dead. We would be as dead." as the former Liberal leader's political prospects. The Honourable Minister for Health and Ageing. Well, Mr Speaker, I do accept that I made an insensitive comment, uh, a very insensitive comment. Uh, I shouldn't have made it, and I apologise. The Honourable Minister for Herbert. Mr uh, Speaker. Order. Mr Minister Speaker. Herbert. My question uh, is addressed to the Foreign Minister. Foreign Minister, I'm interested to know, and I'm sure the House would like to be informed of the international responses to the formation of the Asia-Pacific Asia Partnership on Clean Development and Climate. Uh, Foreign Minister, are there any alternative views? The Honourable Minister for Foreign Affairs. Well, Mr Speaker, first can I thank the honourable member uh, for, for Herbert for his question and for the interest he shows in the issue. The first meeting of the Asia-Pacific Partnership 
um, is to be hosted by Australia later this year. And that will bring together for the first time six key Asia-Pacific countries to pursue a technology-focused pro-growth approach to addressing climate change. And the foundation partners, Australia, the United States, China, Japan, India and Korea, represent about half of the global population GDP and greenhouse gas emissions. Um, this has been wel welcomed, not surprisingly, around the world, Mr Speaker, by the British Environment Minister, who said it was a welcome step forward, the German Environment Minister, the European Commission. Last week I met with the uh, Canadian Environment Minister, Stephen Dion, and um, he came to Adelaide, and uh, he said that Canada would be interested in playing a role in the partnership as well. Several other countries, by the way, have also expressed an interest in joining. Are there any alternative views, Mr Speaker? On the, uh, within the Labor Party, there are several alternative views. The opposition leader, um, thinking there might be votes in it, I suppose, said that this was just, this is, it is nothing. That's what he described it as, it is nothing. The member for Grandler issued two press releases in two days condemning the partnership. Secret climate pact more spin than substance, he said and climate pact spin and hypocrisy, sort of classic opposition press releases. But, Mr Speaker, if I may say so, it is, I, it, I am thankful to some members of the ALP for turning around the ALP policy. The Shadow Minister for Resources, the member for Batman, in a speech on 23 August, didn't say it was nothing, as his leader says. He welcomed the initiative, saying it represented a regional partnership of great significance and even greater opportunity, with the capacity to make a serious global impact on patterns of energy use and greenhouse gas emissions. Now, Mr. Speaker, I very much welcome the contribution of the member for Batman. Somebody in the opposition is having a bit of a think about the substance of what is going on in Australia instead of just trying to work out what the latest opportunistic political line might be. And the tragedy is that uh, you've got someone like the member for Batman, who's not mentioned at the moment as a possible leader of the opposition. But, uh, Mr. Speaker, given the, given the more serious approach he takes to public issues, I think he'd make a much better leader of the opposition than the, uh, um, than the opportunist who happens to be sitting in that chair for the moment. The Honourable the Manager of Opposition Business. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is again to the Minister for Health and Ageing. Is the minister aware that his Liberal Party colleague and member of the Senate, Senator George Brandis, has said, in reference to the minister's inappropriate remarks of 31 August, and I quote, I think it was a disgusting thing to do. Does the minister agree that what he has done is, and I quote, disgusting? The Minister for Health and Ageing may choose to answer that question. The Minister for Health and Ageing. Well, Mr. Speaker, look, I, I did the wrong thing, and I've apologised, Mr. Speaker, and I'm not, and I, and I, and I, and I, and, I, and I'm not, and I'm not going to quibble uh, with criticism that my colleagues wish to make. The honourable member for Deakin. The, thank the you, member Mr. For Speaker. Deakin has the call. Mr. Speaker, my question is addressed to the Minister for Employment and Workplace Relations. Would the minister inform the House of current impediments to the productivity in the Australian building construction industry? What are alternative views? The Honourable the Minister for Employment and Workplace Relations. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I thank the member for Deakin for his question and say to him, to the House, that uh, we are on the cusp of major reform of the building and construction industry in Australia, reform which has been four years in the making, reform which will see the end of the unlawful, corrupt and illegal behaviour that was identified by the Coal Royal Commission in the commercial building and construction industry. And it's notable, Mr Speaker, uh, that this reform has been fought tooth and nail by the ALP and the Leader of the Opposition. Uh, and yet, in the Coal Royal Commission, uh, Justice Cole identified the Leader of the Opposition's own state as one in which some of the most corrupt practices occurred. This is what the Coal Royal Commission said, Mr Speaker, about Western Australia. The building and construction industry in Western Australia is marred by unlawful and inappropriate conduct. Fear, intimidation and coercion are commonplace. Contractors, subcontractors and workers face this culture continuously. 
At the centre of this culture and much of the unlawful and inappropriate conduct is the CFMEU. Now, Mr. Speaker, this is important economic reform because it delivers benefits to all Australians. The reality is, as the Econ Tech report demonstrated, that getting rid of the corrupt and unlawful behaviour in the commercial building and construction sector could lead to a 1 per cent increase in GDP in Australia, something which flows through to ordinary Australians whose retirement investment is tied up uh, largely and partly uh, in the major constructions in the capital cities around Australia. That is, that the extra cost of building major buildings uh, in Australia is something which flows through and affects the retirement incomes of many hundreds of thousands. Thousands of Australians. Now, it's appalling, Mr. Speaker, that in the face of this clear evidence about con corruption and unlawful behaviour, uh, it's appalling that the Leader of the Opposition won't support uh, what's going on. Instead, what we have from the Opposition uh, is a, a support for what they call the Victorian system. In fact, we had uh, Labor senators at the 2004 inquiry into this bill saying the committee majority recommends that the government promote cultural change through the industry by encouraging states to institute tripartite industry councils at state level. The Victorian model could be used as an exemplar. Well, the exemplar of the Victorian model, Mr. Speaker, is what the Herald Sun described last year as wrought city. Unions free beer, barbecues and phantom pay cost the state millions. Not only does the Labor Party they want wrought city in Melbourne and wrought in Victoria. They want a policy which basically means wrought nation rather than just wrought city. Well, Mr. Speaker, this this government, Mr. Speaker, is going to do something about the rorts in the building construction sector. We will get this legislation through the parliament, and for once, this side of parliament will do something to clean up that unlawful and corrupt behaviour. The Honourable the Leader of the Opposition. My question is to the Prime Minister. Is the Prime Minister aware that the mental health sector has said the following about the 31st August remarks made by the Minister for Health? I quote, for any minister, let alone the Federal Health Minister, who Order. has direct responsibility for the National Suicide Prevention Strategy, to use the tragic circumstances of John Brogdon to make a political point is quite outrageous. Prime Minister, given both health professionals and members of your party have lost confidence in the Minister for Health, will the Prime Minister ask for his resignation? The Honourable Prime Minister. No. The Honourable Member for Macmillan. Mr Speaker, my question is addressed to the Minister for Transport and Regional Services. Would the Minister advise the House of recent progress the Government has made in meeting national transport infrastructure needs? The Honourable Minister for Transport and Regional Services. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I thank the honourable member for Macmillan for his question. He's well aware of the government's commitment to the $12.7 billion Auslink initiative, uh, something which will help in, uh, involve our nation in upgrading infrastructure, particularly in road and rail, uh, from one end of the country to the other. Some major nation-building projects are involved in uh, in, in uh, the Auslink plan, and I'm very pleased to, to note that in the member's own state of Victoria. Uh, there's been a ready commitment to the Auslink program, and as a result, some significant projects are already underway. And the government's committed $121 million to the Pakenham Bypass, as just as an example. But unfortunately, uh, other states have not followed Victoria and, uh, and South Australia's lead. Uh, in fact, uh, states like New South Wales, Queensland, Western Australia have still not signed up to Auslink. And as a result, uh, funding from the Commonwealth for important road and rail projects uh, ended on the 1st of July. There's simply no funding available to those states unless they're prepared to be a part of the Auslink process, which will unlock significant financial resources to those states. Right. Now, I've, I've been meeting with the ministers in, in various states to try and talk through the issues. It is important that they be resolved because we want to get on with the task of building many of these important projects. Now, the Bonville stretch on the Pacific Highway, I know the member for Cowper has been particularly concerned about that, and recent accidents demonstrate again how vital it is that that project should proceed. The Commonwealth's ready, our funds are ready, all we're, all we're waiting on is New South Wales to sign the Osnick Agreement and get on with the task. And there's similar projects I know in Queensland and other states ready to go. So I call upon the states to move quickly to agree to the Auslink arrangements. Victoria and South Australia have agreed, so why is there such a problem for people in other states? If they don't get involved, they don't get involved quickly, 
from the 1st of October, Order. all of the unsigned agreements will also be subject to the new construction code guidelines that the honourable member for industrial the relations member has one. just spoken about. So the member I'd one. encourage all of the transport ministers to uh, to immediately make commitments to Osling so we can get on with the, the, the important task of these nation-building construction projects uh, in every state. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. My question is to the Prime Minister. Does the Prime Minister recall saying about the matter involving Mr John Brogdon that, and I quote, well, look, his future is obviously a matter for him, and it's a matter for his parliamentary colleagues. That's a matter for the State Parliamentary Labor Party. But that sort of comment, that's Brogdon's, State Parliamentary Party, but that sort of comment is just quite wrong. Prime Minister, weren't the comments made by the Minister for Health after Mr Brogdon's suicide attempt quite wrong? Well, the Prime Minister applied the same standard he applied to Mr Brogdon to his Minister for Health and have the matter dealt with by his parliamentary party on the same basis that the Minister for Health resigned. The Honourable Prime Minister. Well, Mr Speaker, the answer to the first part of the question is yes. The answer uh, to the second, part of the second two parts the second and third parts of the question, let me put it the way that, Mr Speaker, is that uh, Mr Abbott, uh, the Minister for Health and Ageing, uh, uh, has, has apologised for his remarks. He continues to enjoy my full confidence. Ministers in my government are appointed by the Prime Minister. The Honourable Member for Greenway. Mr Speaker, my question is addressed to the Minister for Human Services. Would the Minister inform the House what recent measures the government has order. taken to ensure. Order! 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 The member for Greenway has the call. Would the minister inform the House what recent measures the government has taken to ensure that people are paid their correct entitlements under our welfare system? The Honourable Minister for Human Services. <laughs> <laughs> it's almost good to be yeah, yeah. Did you make a request of your employer for parental um, leave? No, I did, yes. <laughs> Prime Minister, it's coming. Uh, I'd like to thank the member for Greenway, the hard-working member for Greenway, for her question, Mr Speaker. Uh, Mr Speaker, the uh, Minister for Workforce Participation and I on Friday uh, launched a new marketing campaign called Support the System That Supports You, which is uh, an attempt to properly inform all Australians that they should uh, properly support the welfare system and if they engage in fraud they will be caught and they could end up going to jail. Now this program is very important, Mr Speaker. Fraud and compliance is a key part of Centrelink's activities. Last year Centrelink reviewed over 4 million entitlements and that resulted in over 700,000 customers having their Order. payments cancelled or reduced. We save over $50 million a week as a result of fraud and compliance activity, Mr Speaker. And uh, Centrelink uh, investigated 70,000 tip-offs, and that resulted in 17,500 customers having their payments cancelled or reduced. Last year, Mr Speaker, if we can send a message to those who are attempting to defraud the system, last year there were nearly 3,000 convictions for welfare fraud. 3,000 convictions for welfare fraud. Now, Mr Speaker, we have to do our part to help families and, and uh, those people endeavouring to do their best to uh, uh, properly comply with the system. And, Mr Speaker, uh, one of the ways to do it is to bring together the agencies within human services to work in partnership as against uh, working sometimes against the interests of each other. And, Mr Speaker, I can re report that the Senate has just passed the Human Services Legislation Bill, which ensures that uh, Centrelink and the Health Insurance Commission no longer have boards, are directly reportable to the Minister, that being me, and Mr Speaker, uh, the HIC after 30 years will become Medicare Australia. So what does that mean, that partnership? Well, Mr Speaker, it was brought to my attention that in order to claim the maternity payment or in order to claim uh, your Medicare card for your new child, or in order to claim the family tax benefit, Mr. Speaker, you had to fill out these extraordinary forms, these extraordinary forms that go on forever, covering pages and pages of questions, Mr. Speaker, more than 32 questions, 
And in addition, you'd need to go separately, not just to Centrelink, but separately to Medicare to get your Medicare card. Well, Mr. Speaker, as from March next year, a three-page form, a three-page form replaces here, here. this indecipherable, here. complex form that ends up causing people great grief. Mr. Speaker, that is going to save Australian families seven million pages of questions each year. Seven million pages of questions each year. That's what human services is about. Better delivery for consumers. The honourable leader of the opposition. Now my question is to the prime minister, Mr. Order. Speaker. Order. I refer. I, I refer the prime minister to the view that he's expressed in public that Mr Brogdon's comments and behaviour made in a social setting were inappropriate. If the Prime Minister believes the former New South Wales Leader of the Opposition's remarks were inappropriate and, quote, that uh, the right decision was taken by Mr Brogdon, why won't he apply the same standards to his own minister whose comments were made in a sober state and in his official capacity as Minister for Health? The Honourable the Prime Minister. Mr uh, Speaker, I have already indicated to the parliament that uh, the Minister for Health and Ageing has uh, apologised for the remarks he made, Mr Speaker. Um, I'm, uh, my Order. responsibility Order. and my authority extends to the appointment of ministers. I believe, that Mr. I believe that the Minister for Health and Ageing has been an outstanding minister and I have no intention of terminating his commission. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. I seek leave to move the following motion. That this House censure the Minister for Health and Ageing for failing to resign after making cruel and callous remarks following the suicide attempt of the former Leader of the Opposition in New South Wales, remarks that demonstrate the Minister's complete incapacity to provide any leadership on mental health issues. Is leave granted? I thank the House. Please, the, the Honourable the Leader of the Opposition. Mr Speaker, it is a serious matter when any opposition decides that it will move a censure motion on a matter like this. To be able to justify a censure motion, you have to demonstrate that the Minister has acted well outside the standards that would be expected of a person holding a particular portfolio. And that means that if the offence is related to directly to, to that portfolio, it is a very serious matter indeed. And the remarks made by the, uh, the Minister for Health on the uh, situation on the day after the attempted suicide by the former, minister, former leader of the opposition in uh, New South Wales were exactly, precisely the sorts of remarks that would be made by a minister no longer fit to hold the position of Minister for Health. Mr Brogdon made inappropriate remarks in his cups, and that's no excuse, but he made them in his cups about the family of his predecessor, and he left the leadership of the Liberal Party on the basis of it. The Minister for Health made completely inappropriate remarks about the circumstances in which Mr Brogdon found himself, made it in the cruelest possible way, fully reflecting the massively poisonous atmosphere that prevails in the New South Wales Liberal Party, fully reflecting that, but in the process, in the process causing anguish and concern amongst many of the people in the community who have to deal with the minister, that when they are dealing with him on health matters, they face a clumsy, callous individual with no sincerity in him, a blockhead absolutely determined that, uh, as far as he is concerned, nothing he does or says matters a whit to them, who has no natural sympathy or concern no natural sympathy or concern about the people with whom he must deal. And he is protected in this place by a Prime Minister who makes one set of judgments about his political enemies in the Liberal Party and another set of judgments about his political supporters. And his supporters in the Liberal Party and members of the Liberal Party can have no confidence in any dispassionate dealing with them by the man who is Prime Minister of this country. And this whole sorry episode <coughs> reflects the hubris, reflects the arrogance, 
reflects the cast of mind which has developed inside the government since uh, the last election and, more particularly, since they got control of the Senate. They could not care less. They could not care less about appropriate standards of behaviour. They could not care less about respect for the community. They could not care less about anguish and concern in the community on any particular matter, be it from petrol prices to mental health. They could not care less. But we care a great deal, and we are going to hold this government accountable. And to watch this government react and scream and squirm when subject to a bit of decent questioning in question time today, trying to hold themselves them accountable while they flick past responsibility on uh, a variety of matters here was not an edifying spectacle for anyone interested in the issues of good government in this country. And let me go to uh, the Prime Minister's performance when Mr Brogdon made the statements that he did in the immediate aftermath of the uh, public revelation of the, of, of the utterly unacceptable comments that he had made about uh, Mr Carr and his other appropriate misbehaviours uh, with women in the press gallery in, the, uh, in New South Wales. Because I can recollect the Prime Minister's demeanour very well. It's his demeanour that counts at least as much as his words on these subjects. And his demeanour was, this man's gone. His demeanour was, this is an opportunity. His demeanour was, one of the people whom I despise in the Liberal Party has turned himself broadside on and I'm going to stick a torpedo right into the middle of his political career. And that foolish man, of course, recognised his foolishness and he apologised. <coughs> he apologised at that point of time. The apology was not accepted with alacrity by the Prime Minister. Uh, we wouldn't accept it with alacrity and, and why would you expect us to? For us, the offence and the hurt was vastly greater than anything that could conceivably have been experienced by the government. But it was an interesting thing the Prime Minister was not interested in Mr Brogdon's position being defended by an apology. Oh no, the Prime Minister said portentously, this is a matter for the state party, but this is not an acceptable statement. And when Mr Brogdon resigned, you couldn't see the Prime Minister get onto the radio fast enough to put himself into a position whereby the body language, the nudging, the intonation in the comments was, well, really, I had something to do with this. I had to oh, get real. You get real. You start, you're a new member in this place. You start to face a few facts about party life in the Order. Parliamentary Liberal Order. Party. Because I can assure you, my friend, you are going to be obliged to before this term in Parliament is out. So you get real, young man. You get real because you are going to, you are going to have to answer for in your constituency for, uh, for the behaviours of your ministers order, over the order. course of the, the next couple of years. Let the resume his seat. Uh, the honourable member for Murray. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I ask that you remind the Speaker, Leader of the Opposition, to address his remarks to the Chair. I thank the member for Murray, and I would ask the Leader of the Opposition to refer to members by the uh, seat. Yeah, sorry, I don't know. It's, I don't know it's, but anyway, such is life. Well, Mr. Speaker, that of course is a is a distraction, but a distraction which here illustrates the point, which absolutely illustrates the point. We had the Prime Minister there manoeuvring. We had the Prime Minister describe, conforming to a description given of one of his uh, predecessors by uh, by Gough Whitlam, which I remember so well and stands so well, I think, in, uh, in comparison and as a, uh, as a contrast from this particular case. He then said of Billy McMahon what could well have been said about John Howard in so many situations, Tiberius on a telephone. Tiberius on a telephone through to his colleagues in the New South Wales Labor Party the intention of making absolutely certain that Brogdon's career was over and that Brogdon had gone. There was no defence from the Prime Minister and the public. He didn't come out and say, well, Mr Brogdon has apologised. 
He has apologised in detail to Mr Carr. He has apologised in detail to the women who were offended by his behaviour at that particular party. No suggestion by the Prime Minister. Well, that's sufficient. That's all that requires to be done in this case. Mr Brogdon, of course, is a valued member of the Parliamentary Liberal Party at the state level. He has been a close associate of myself. He has given me support in the past. I would want to see Mr Brogdon survive. Not for one minute. Not for one minute did you hear any sentiment like that. Now, it is our situation in the Australian Labor Party that people out there in the public, in the media, have always been fascinated by our internal arrangements. They have always been interested in what we do around about pre-selection time and how we organise the affairs of our branches. I can tell you this. The structure of the party in the Australian Labor Party is such that while from time to time you can breach the rules and stack out a branch in a particular area, what you cannot do is stack a whole branch. Our structure of our rules are such that there is a protection there that is, it turns out to be a community interest protection. But you can stack a whole branch in the Liberal Party. You can take out an entire state division when, you're, when you put your mind to it. And what has happened in New South Wales and is reflected in these circumstances is that a narrowly based group ideologically has taken out the entire Liberal Party and apparently has the approval of the Prime Minister and a large number of members of the Parliament, Parliamentary Liberal Party from this state. And the truth of the matter is that the then leader, the leader of the opposition, or the, the former leader of the opposition, was not sacked for the comments that he made about Mr Carr's wife, though he should have been, was not sacked for the behaviours that he demonstrated to the women journalists, but he should have been. He was sacked because he found himself on the wrong side of a factional divide and the factional divides found the Prime Minister on the other side to him. Now, just understand that. Let's understand that. Brogdon went not because of what Brogdon had to say, but because of what Brogdon represented in the Parliamentary Liberal Party. And if you wanted evidence that that is the case, all you need to do is look at what has happened here today. Was Mr Brogdon's apology any less comprehensive than the apology just given by the Minister for Health? Was it any less comprehensive? Was Mr Brogdon's apology? No, it was not. It was indeed Mr Brogdon's apology was far more extensive. Mr Brogdon's efforts to deal with the hurt even more extensive. He attempted to ring Mr Carr. Mr Carr understandably did not take his call, nor would I in those circumstances, but the attempt was made. He, had, he rang the, the women who had been offended by his behaviour. He attempted to make amends. For the first time in the last 30 hours, we see the Minister for Health stand up in this place and apologise. He has not been out there on the airways. As far as I'm aware, he has made no effort to ring Mr Brogdon. He has made no effort to apologise to the person who has, uh, who has been offended by this. This man has finally come in here at the, the death knock in terms of parliamentary debate on this issue and has responded, responded finally, finally with an apology. Not an extensive apology at all, not an apology which reflects the character of his portfolio, but just that's it. And then he sits down immediately after it and starts winking away at the Prime Minister. Yes, exactly. He showed exactly the level of seriousness with which he regarded the uh, atonement that he made, sitting there winking away at the Prime Minister. Now I understand the Prime Minister doesn't comprehend Morse code, so there is no other reason, there is no other message conveyed by that blink except, ha ha, we got away with this one. We got away with this one. So there is one standard in the Prime Minister's mind, in the Liberal Party, for people who are his factional opponents, right. 
That's right. And there is another standard here for the members or the ministers he regards as his supporters. So that's the this. parliamentary Liberal Party, and that's the state of factional affairs in the Liberal Party. But there is a wider audience here. There is an audience which is now beginning to treat with great seriousness mental health issues in this country. There is a substantial debate now in this nation on mental health issues. There was a view in the 1980s that uh, taking those with mental afflictions out of institutions, putting them in the general community, was the right way to go. There has been an experience as a result of that in the general community of, in the case of some individuals, very great difficulties. There has been a difficulty, a considerable difficulty, in the, uh, in the justice systems of most of the states now as they attempt to deal with the consequences of a mental health system in which there is very little capacity for them to be able to protect the community and serve the needs of those who have found themselves with affliction. That is a substantial issue now in Australian politics. There is a further issue related to that and the broader issue in the community. The questions raised by the former Premier of Victoria, Jeff Kennett, who now leads an organisation devoted to the study and research of depression and of making wide, knowledge wide in the Australian community that here is an affliction, a state of mind, which uh, is far more widespread than uh, has previously been comprehended that is a, an experience of a mental state likely to be experienced by a very large number of Australians, and that we need to be a more open society and more forthcoming society in dealing with these issues. And at the heart, of course, of the contemplation of both of these concerns lies the ministries of the health at the state and federal level. And there is a further concern related to mental health issues now in our community. And that goes to the question of suicide, the ultimate, the culmination of a variety of mental afflictions, some of which may be physiological, some of which may be purely psychological, but utterly tragic. And there is an understanding now particularly of the problems related to suicide amongst men and boys. And the particular strains that have come in contemporary social conditions on young men and men of middle age, as they face a world of greater insecurities, as they face a world that doesn't present them with the same sorts of challenges that take them out of side themselves in a way in which times past have done. These are issues which are beyond partisan politics, frankly. They're beyond the capacity for anyone in this chamber to be right. They are issues which we as a community now need to confront collectively and arrive at conclusions. They don't lend themselves to ideology. They don't lend themselves to classic formulations around social democracy or liberalism or conservatism. They're the things of the heart and mind that go beyond the norms of politics. But one thing you absolutely need, one thing you absolutely need, and that is that the person who holds the position of Minister for Health, be they at the state level or be they at the federal level, should be a person whose demeanour, whose carriage, whose every word lends weight to a consideration on the part of the afflicted or those responsible for the afflicted, that when they approach this man or woman, they approach this person of an honestly open cast of mind. A person with a breadth of view, a person prepared to accept that maybe he is not correct, a person who does on, on any particular matter, a person who does not go bullheaded at new problems and new issues in his portfolio. There is nobody in the mental health community or those concerned with mental health issues who thinks for one minute that in the Minister for Health they have such a person. He had problems in this area to start with. He has made statements to this point of time, which I'm sure the, I'm sure the second of this motion will deal with. He has made statements to this point of time which cast very severe doubt 
on whether he thinks the things I've been talking about are problems at all, or if they are problems, they're a matter merely of will. So he had a cast of mind to start with to be enormously dismissive of his Liberal Party colleague in New South Wales. Dismissive of him because he stands for that section of the New South Wales Liberal Party which believes in openness and tolerance, that believes in a broad community. Dismissive of him for those points of view and now dismissive of him for what they considered to be, on his part, weakness. And so he could make a joke at his expense 24 hours after he made it. You cannot be Minister for Health and do that. You may have, you shouldn't have, but you may have got away with it if you happen to be Minister for Defence or Minister for or the Treasurer or something like that. You shouldn't have got away with it. You absolutely cannot get away with it if you happen to be Minister for Health. Right. Now this minister should go. The Prime Minister is too weak to sack him. He's got a leadership challenge underway, incipient, we know, from the Treasurer, and therefore your allies are important to you. Your allies are important to you, and he's one of the allies of the Prime Minister in that particular, in that particular confrontation with the, with the Treasurer. So the Prime Minister needs to keep him on side. But he can do the right thing. He's had several opportunities and do the right thing since the last election. He should have gone for misleading the Australian people. And I might say his apology to the Australian people has, uh, has been as, has la as much lack of comprehensiveness as the apology that we've just heard today. But uh, we ought to have seen this minister go for the misleading, deliberate misleading of the Australian people at the last election. He did not. He decided that he would cling to office. And he clings to office again here today. He clings to office again here today. Well, Mr Speaker, he should go. He should do the right thing. Mr Brogdon, when confronted with these circumstances, started with an apology and proceeded from an apology to resignation. Mr Abbott has now finally, 30 hours on, finally, after we put him under questioning on it, come into this place and apologised. He's done it nowhere else. Now he should move on. He should follow Mr Brogdon's example and take the second Order. step and leave Le this parliament and leave time this government. Has expired. Is the motion seconded? The manager of opposition business. I second the motion and reserve my right to speak. The leader of the house. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, Mr. Speaker, uh, I, uh, I do accept uh, that uh, the statements uh, that I made were insensitive. Uh, I do ex accept that they shouldn't have been made. Uh, I do accept uh, that they were altogether inappropriate, and Mr. Speaker, I, uh, I am sorry for them. And uh, I have apologised, and I am happy to apologise again. I Order. am very sorry uh, that I have given offence uh, to uh, the former leader of the opposition in New South Wales. Uh, I am very sorry that I have given offence to some of my own colleagues. Uh, I am very sorry even that I have given offence uh, uh, to members opposite, Mr Speaker. Uh, let me simply say that uh, uh, I am certainly not uh, a perfect human being. Uh, I make mistakes, uh, uh, as all of us do. Uh, perhaps I make more than most people, Mr. Speaker. But uh, when I make a mistake, I apologise and I attempt uh, to make amends. Order. And, Mr. Speaker, uh, for the information of uh, the leader of the opposition, uh, yesterday afternoon uh, I called what I believe was the best number uh, for the former leader of the opposition in New South Wales. Uh, to uh, uh, make it clear to him uh, that uh, I had said the wrong thing uh, and that I was sorry, uh, and uh, if he wanted to make contact with me to discuss it, I was only, I was only too happy. Uh, Mr Speaker, um, we are in the presence here uh, of a, a tragedy, Mr Speaker. We saw unfold uh, on Monday of last week uh, a political tragedy uh, which subsequently became a personal tragedy. Uh, and like everyone in this parliament, and I'm sure everyone in this country, I feel deeply, deeply sorry uh, for John Brogdon, uh, his family. Uh, and his uh, political colleagues in New South Wales. Now, Mr. Speaker, uh, I, uh, I make it Order. very clear. I make it very clear. Uh, Order. That the leader the of the opposition was heard in silence. 
that the, the house is the call. That the throwaway line of mine uh, at a small fundraiser uh, for Barry O'Farrell uh, in the Speaker's dining room of the New South Wales Parliament uh, on Wednesday was most insensitive. It was most insensitive. Uh, it shouldn't have been said. Uh, and uh, I'm happy uh, again to apologise, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the ironic comment, the ironic comment uh, that I made uh, at the Kenthurst branch, uh, also I shouldn't have made. Uh, I certainly don't think that uh, anyone who was present at that uh, would have thought I was being in any way critical of John Brogdon. Uh, but I certainly accept uh, that the comment was open to misinterpretation. Uh, it shouldn't have been said under all the circumstances, uh, and again, uh, I apologise. But, Mr. Speaker, we live in a tough public culture. Uh, politicians give each other no quarter. Uh, the media is absolutely ruthless uh, at uh, everyone's mistakes. Uh, the public uh, are highly. Uh, judgmental. I'm not complaining about it, Mr. Speaker, any more than I'm complaining about the caterwauling uh, from members opposite. It's just the world uh, that we live in. Uh, I accept, Mr. Speaker, that my colleagues uh, have a right uh, to make critical comments uh, about me uh, under all these circumstances, and I certainly am not in any way going to quibble uh, with the judgments uh, that they make. Now, Mr. Speaker, uh, the Leader of the Opposition made a number of critical comments. Uh, about the Prime Minister uh, and about the New South Wales Liberal Party. Uh, he claimed that the former leader of the New South Wales Liberal Party uh, was the victim of some kind of factional ploy. Uh, let me make it very clear that John Brogdon received strong support uh, from his colleagues in New South Wales Order. on Monday morning. Uh, he received strong support from his leadership team, the uh, member he for received Swan. strong support uh, from uh, those members of the federal parliamentary party who were in contact with him. Uh, uh, Bill Heffernan, for instance, uh, Senator Heffernan, uh, gave him strong support. Uh, of course, of course, uh, it was up to his party room uh, to make any judgments uh, about the leadership, as it is always up to every party room and caucus uh, to make judgments about the leadership. But the point is, the point is uh, that John Brogdon had all the support that a state parliamentary leader has a right to expect from the federal party, including the Prime Minister and including everyone on this government's front bench. Now, Mr Speaker, I accept uh, that the New South Wales uh, Parliamentary Party uh, has not had uh, a happy time uh, since losing government uh, a decade ago. But I think that the honourable conduct of John Brogdon uh, in resigning when he had made a serious mistake, I think the honourable conduct of Barry O'Farrell uh, in, in, in putting the good of the party uh, before his own personal advancement, I think that these gentlemen uh, have laid the foundations for a renaissance of our party. I have to say, Mr. Speaker, the member for Denison of the things that uh, uh, has been lacking uh, amongst uh, the New South Wales Party uh, has been an, an inability uh, to give colleagues the benefit of the doubt. Uh, and I think that what we have seen over the last few days in the New South Wales Party does offer considerable hope uh, of a better future uh, than the recent past. Uh, one of the uh, strengths of the federal parliamentary Liberal Party has been that we have never leapt uh, to uh, immediate critical conclusions uh, of our colleagues. Uh, we have not rushed to believe the worst of each other. Uh, and I think that uh, uh, the example of people like Barry O'Farrell and the honour of people like John Brogdon uh, suggests that those same sentiments are, are quite possibly, are quite possibly uh, beginning to be appreciated now uh, in, the, in the New South Wales Parliamentary Party. Uh, Mr Speaker, there have been some claims uh, that the New South Wales Parliamentary Party uh, has been taken over by extremists. Uh, let me repudiate those claims. Let me repudiate those claims. Uh, there is nothing wrong, there is nothing wrong uh, with people uh, who are uh, practising Christians. 
are also being members of the member for Cornwall should be aware it's clearly there is disorderly nothing wrong from outside your seat. with the New South Wales Upper House member David Clark simply because simply because he goes to church on Sunday and simply because he shares views that are not uncommon even amongst some decent members uh, of, uh, of, of the political party uh, sitting opposite me now. Mr Speaker, uh, what is wrong uh, with going to church and also being a member of a political party uh, and also being uh, a member of parliament? Order. Mr Speaker, some critical comments have been made. Some critical comments have been made in the course of this debate uh, about, uh, about the government's policy uh, on mental health. Uh, uh, some critical comments have been made of me uh, by people who are involved uh, in mental health organisations. Well, Mr Speaker, I can fully understand uh, that anyone involved uh, in advocacy uh, of, pe of people with mental health issues uh, would, would be unhappy uh, at any suggestion that someone might have made light uh, of uh, John Brogdon's personal tragedy. Uh, Mr Speaker, they are entitled uh, to be annoyed. Uh, I accept uh, their criticisms uh, and I will do my best uh, to make amends. Uh, Mr Speaker, this is a government uh, which has a good record uh, on mental health. Uh, we have increased, we have increased uh, mental health spending uh, from all sources including the, Medi the Medicare benefit schedule and the Pharmaceutical Benefit Scheme, uh, from under $800 million uh, to, uh, in 1996 to over $1.1 billion today uh, in constant dollar terms. This is almost a 50 per cent uh, real in increase. Mr Speaker, the Better Outcomes in Mental Health program uh, has resulted in some 4,500 GPs receiving additional training in the diagnosis and treatment of mental health problems. Uh, that program uh, is a tribute to, uh, to its originator, Dr Michael Wooldridge, and indeed uh, to this government, which has sustained it. Uh, I point out, Mr Speaker, that the government committed an extra $110 million uh, to various mental health programs in the election campaign, and in the recent budget we more than delivered on that commitment. But, Mr Speaker, we haven't stopped there. Uh, there is a Human Rights and Equal Opportunities uh, Commission inquiry uh, into mental health. Uh, its report is due soon. Uh, with the government's support, there is a Senate inquiry uh, into mental health. Uh, this government will respond intelligently and sensitively uh, to those reports. Uh, Mr Speaker, uh, um, I'm not surprised. Uh, I'm not surprised uh, that uh, members opposite have, have called uh, for my resignation. Uh, Mr Speaker, the member for Lawler has called for my resignation on no fewer than seven separate occasions uh, <laughs> since November uh, 2004. Uh, I haven't, I haven't, I haven't, I haven't, Order. I haven't counted, Order. I haven't counted, I haven't counted the Order. number of times the leader of the opposition uh, has called for my resignation. Uh, but in, in, uh, in either his first or his second coming, uh, I'm confident that it's happened uh, on, uh, on quite a number of occasions. Uh, Mr Speaker, if, if some good at least, if some good at least uh, has come uh, from all uh, the sorry business uh, of the last week or so, uh, including my own crass and insensitive remarks, at least the Leader of the Opposition is finally talking about health. Uh, he hasn't talked much about health, uh, but at least he has spent a little bit of time talking about mental health, uh, and I hope, Mr Speaker, he continues doing that uh, in the weeks and months ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Honourable Manager of Opposition Business. Thank you, Mr Speaker. There's nothing wrong with going to church on Sunday, but there is something wrong with hypocrisy, and that's what we've seen on display in the last 48 hours. The Minister for Health has come into this place and order, claimed order, to have apologised for his grossly insensitive remarks, order. and that claim simply isn't true. Simply isn't true. Now, Mr. Speaker, let's just take ourselves back to what happened here and then go through his bogus claims to have apologised. What happened here is a man tried to kill himself. That's what happened here. A tragedy. A young man tried to kill himself. And the Minister for Health 
24 hours after a young man tried to kill himself, is that a branch of the Liberal Party and he's cracking hardy about it. It's very funny, isn't it, Minister? It's very funny when a young man tries to kill himself and he's cracking hardy and he says, I just want to make it clear I've never told an inappropriate joke, I've never pinched a woman on the backside and I've never made inappropriate gestures to women. Well, putting aside what the question as to whether those statements are true or not, there he is making jokes at the expense of a young man who's tried to kill himself less than 24 hours after it happened. But even worse, Mr Speaker, even worse, less than 12 hours after it happened, in the presence of health industry professionals, a meeting he is at in his capacity as Minister for Health, he is asked about a health policy proposal and he responds, if we did that, we would be as dead as the formal Liberal leader's political prospects. A young man has tried to kill himself, and he says, if we did that, we would be as dead as the former Liberal leader's political prospects. Well, what a disgraceful and insensitive and callous set of remarks. And Mr Speaker, I'd like to make a point here that mental health issues and suicide attempts are not different from any other set of health issues. If John Brogdon had been diagnosed with cancer, what would people have thought of those remarks? If the Minister for Health had been there going, that's deader than John Brogdon's political career, if he'd been diagnosed with cancer, or if he'd been tragically injured in a car accident and was in hospital, cooked to machines, fighting for life, and the Minister for Health was out there saying that's deader than John Brogdon's political career, what would people have thought of that? Well, it's no different, Mr Speaker because Mr Brogdon was involved in a depressive episode and a suicide attempt. It's no different, it's no less callous, it's no less disgusting to use a word that's been used today, and it is so grossly inappropriate for the man who's got the responsibility of mental health federally on his shoulders that he should have offered his resignation. Now, the Minister for Health has come in and said, oh, well, you know, I've apologised. Well, simply not true, Mr Speaker, simply not true. On the show yesterday, when he's asked to apologise, he basically says, oh, well, if it would make people feel better if I apologised, I'm always happy to apologise, you know, if it's going to make someone feel better. And then during the course of the morning yesterday, he adds to that and says, oh, I said on the program this morning, if anyone is upset, I'm happy to apologise. And then when asked if that is an unconditional apology or why he won't make it unconditional, he says, oh, if you'd prefer it that way, I'm happy to apologise. And then today we've heard of some half-assed attempt to try and get John Brogdon on the phone yesterday afternoon. And then, of course, the Minister for Health is being pursued, pursued round Canberra by TV crews looking to see whether or not he's going to apologise. He is finally, we think, caught by Channel 10. And in what, in what is then referred to as an exclusive doorstop, he says, oh, I'm very happy to apologise. I don't like upsetting people. Then he doesn't come into this parliament and proffer an apology by way of statement or even by organising a Dorothy Dix question. No, he takes a Dorothy Dix on bulk billing. And the only way he's come into this parliament and apologise is because we asked him questions. Well, if we hadn't questioned today, there'd be no parliamentary apology. And then the minister fronts a censure motion and says, well, I've apologised in the parliament. Well, too right, minister, because we asked you about it, not because you came in here and volunteered an apology. And you know what is the natural meaning of the word apology? It means you're actually sorry. I don't know if anybody's ever explained that to you. It doesn't mean that you actually utter the word, oh, if I've upset someone, I apologise. It actually means you're sorry. And what we saw at the end of question time, or towards the end of question time, was the Minister for Health wink at the Prime Minister, or oh, got out of that light, or oh, got out of that easy, all done, all dusted, all in, you know, a quick little mea culpa, and maybe oh, I am a bit disgusting, and it's all over and done with. It's all play acting. You never felt in any part of your person sorry for what you did or what has happened. The only thing you're sorry for is you got caught. It's the only thing you're sorry for. And that's not good enough. Now, this, this minister has failed a series of basic tests in relation to this matter. He's first of all failed the test that the Prime Minister set for John Brogdon. 
John Brogdon did a dishonourable thing, a dishonourable thing. And when he had done that dishonourable thing, the Prime Minister was on the airwaves saying this. Well, look, his future is obviously a matter for him and it's a matter for his parliamentary colleagues, but he owes Helena an apology, a very big apology. So there's the Prime Minister setting a test. He's viewed John Brogdon's conduct and he said, well, this man needs to apologise in a big way. And then he's done the political equivalent of throwing him to the wolves and not backing him in, saying that's a matter for his parliamentary colleagues. That's the test the Prime Minister set when John Brogdon had made an inappropriate remark and behaved inappropriately at a social event. Well, why should the Prime Minister's test be any different when it's applied to the Minister for Health, who is at a formal function in his capacity as Minister for Health, and makes grossly inappropriate remarks about a young man who has tried to commit suicide? By the Prime Minister's own test, not only does this man owe an apology, a big apology, which hasn't been given in any proper form yet, but he ought to place himself in the fate of his, the, his fate in the hands of his parliamentary colleagues, and we all know what that means. If he did that, that would mean that he was offering his resignation. Now, why is there one standard articulated by the Prime Minister who should be in this parliament now, but he's not, and perhaps that's indicating something? But why, why should there be one prime ministerial standard for John Brogdon and one standard for the Minister for Health? Well, we know they're close. We know teachers' pets, you know, sitting on the Prime Minister's lap, lap dog, doing all the jobs the Prime Minister asks him to do. You know, the Prime Minister sends him out on super and then kicks him in the guts on super and he comes back and says, Oh, I've never been prouder of the Prime Minister than I am today. We know that the Prime Minister enjoys having him prancing around on and off the lap, doing everything that he wants done. But it doesn't, it, doesn't mean, it doesn't mean when you're drawing standards that you draw a lesser standard. And if the Prime Minister was serious about the John Brogdon standard, then it should be applied to this minister and this minister should resign. He's not only failed the Prime Minister's standard, he's failed the test of his own colleagues. The most vicious criticism of this man has not come from the Labor Party, Mr Speaker, has not come from the Labor Party, it's come from his own parliamentary colleagues. It's come from New South Wales Liberals. The current leader of the opposition in New South Wales said, and I quote, I can't believe you'd make such stupid and insensitive remarks. And then, of course, there is John Ryan, the uh, deputy leader of the Liberal Party in the Legislative Council, who said, and I quote, I'm sickened saddened and disgusted. If we can't be seen to care for each other in a time of need, the public will hardly believe that we care about them. And then, of course, Senator Brandis today, who has referred to the minister's conduct as disgusting. He's failed a prime ministerial standard. He's failed the test set by his own colleagues, and they are two tests which should lead any honourable man to proffering his resignation. But of course, Mr Speaker, it goes on from there because he's failed the test of the Australian community. Can I, without using any names, Mr Speaker, because that would be inappropriate, but can I refer you to an email, and it's amongst the many, many emails I've received today from people about this matter, can I refer you to an email from a person who writes, I've suffered from chronic anxiety and depression for a number of years now, and it has altered my life entirely both in career and personal terms. Like many others, I struggle every day to manage it. And to hear someone such as Abbott speak with such contempt and arrogance is offensive in the extreme. I do not feel at all reassured knowing that he is the minister responsible for mental health in our community. He's failed the prime minister's test. He's failed his colleagues' test. And perhaps most importantly of all, he's failed the test that is being brought to bear by decent members of the Australian community, people who know the heartache, know the anguish of confronting mental illness all day, every day. They know that they face stigma wherever they go, in the workplace, in the home, shunned by friends, often shunned by people who provide services. They know what it's like to bear that stigma, and they look to political figures, and more than anything else, they look to those charged with the responsibility for health, for leadership on the question of stigma. And what they're asking for is no more than to be recognised as being unwell, as being ill, 
as being people who are entitled to be treated as human beings. And what does this minister do? What does this minister do faced by that community expectation, this being one of the biggest burdens of disease in Australia? What does he do? He thinks it's pretty funny to crack jokes about someone's suicide attempt, someone he actually knows. Now, what kind of leadership is that? And it's a level of leadership where, across the spectrum, from right to left, from Jeff Kennett through mental health organisations in this community over the last 24 hours have said this man cannot be our leader on health. Cannot. Cannot, having distinguished himself in this particular way, in this devastating way, actually tagged himself as someone who thinks that mental health issues are a rich vein of humour, even when someone has tried to commit suicide. They are begging this government to get them a minister who would be prepared to treat seriously their needs and concerns, and they know, they know that this man will never be it. Now, it's not funny. He's, la he's laughing now, but it's not funny. And when I say from left to right, Mr. Speaker, we're talking about people like the former Victorian Premier Jeff Kennett. Now, I lived in Jeff Kennett's Victoria, and there wasn't a day of my life that I wasn't out trying to do something to get Jeff Kennett to no longer be the Premier of Victoria. He's not a man with whom I've shared any political common cause, but he is right on this. The degree of insensitivity that this minister has shown to people with mental illness when a depression institute like Beyond Blue knocks itself out all day, every day, to try and get community members to understand that people with mental illness should be taken and dealt with as human beings, their needs and concerns dealt with seriously, that we should get over the stigma we've historically applied to them. When a man like Jeff Kennedy is saying this minister has acted so dishonourably, then this minister should be offering his resignation. So he's failed the Prime Minister's test, he's failed the test of his colleagues, he's failed the test of the community, and for all of those reasons he should go. But, Mr Speaker, last and by no means least, he's failed his own test. He's failed his own test. People in this parliament might well remember the day that this parliament struggled to come to terms with the suicide of a parliamentary member, and I refer, of course, to the former member for Isaacs. And we had what was a very emotional, heart-rending debate that day, and I think anybody who was in the parliament in that time period would well recall it. Would well recall it. And I would like to remind the minister sitting here what he said on that day. And he said, one of the things which I know very much disappointed Greg Wilton in his time up here was the relentless character assassination, which goes on both in public and in private. In public, a government and opposition ruthlessly demonise each other, and in private, people on both sides of the fence go around shoving the knife into their colleagues. And this, sadly, has become an endemic way of life, and I hope that the terrible tragedy that befell our late colleague will awaken us up to the need to change that, to try and be more generous to each other. He said that on the day that we were having the condolence motion for Greg Wilton. He was later asked on radio by Fran Kelly, will you change your tone? And he said, yes, I will try. Well, Minister, you've failed your own test, failed it comprehensively and conclusively. Perhaps there's no worse test to fail than your own. And if you're a decent human being, you'd look inside yourself and you'd realise the right thing to do today is to resign. The question is the motion moved by the Leader of the Opposition be agreed to the Honourable the Minister for Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. We've just heard a, 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 a speech on standards. I'd like to ask the member for Lawler, where was she when one of her colleagues described a man who walks with calipers and walking sticks deformed? Where was she when one of her colleagues deformed, uh, described a senior and creditable and respected female journalist as a stinking whore? Where was she when one of her colleagues uh, described, described a senior male journalist as a junkie, as a cocaine addict? Where was she? All those comments were made by the, the, the former member for Werra, and uh, they were all made and documented over a period of time in regard to the female journalist. He made them in this House on the 14th of November 2002. In regard to the male journalist, 
made it on the 15th of October 2002, and in regard to uh, Mr. Tony Staley, whom he described as a deformed character, um, on the 3rd of May 2002. Where, did the member for Lawler ever condemn Mark Latham for those comments? No. She was his numbers man to elevate him to the leadership of the Australian Labor Party. That was the condemnation of Mark Latham for his character assassination, his mockery of people's uh, physical appearance. It was to elevate him to the leadership of the Australian Labor Party. So the, member for, the Minister for Health and Ageing has described his comments as, as crass and insensitive. He has apologised sincerely and genuinely for them and accepts the admonishment of his colleagues and of the community, but not from the member for Lawler, please. Um, so when the member for Lawler said there was some play acting going on in the House today, there certainly is, and it's coming from the member for Lawler, the leader of the opposition, and those colleagues who support this uh, trumped-up um, censure motion. The, the Minister for Health and Ageing clarified his remarks yesterday. He has said repeatedly he apologises in a way I haven't heard. I haven't heard many, if any other member for, of parliament, uh, say, and I certainly have not heard from the Labor Party in regard to Mark Latham. And, and they are just some of the mildest of Mark Latham's personalisations. And, and, and of course, I hear the member Bernie Rapoli. For Oxley, the member for Oxley, it's a bit hard to remember him. He's not the highest profile member. The member for Oxley interjected with, and where's he now? Well, the point is, you made him leader of the opposition. You put him up as alternate prime minister, and it's all very well now to wash your hands of Mark Latham. Mark Latham poisoned the Labor Party poisoned and, and uh, damaged its reputation. The, min the Minister for Health and Ageing has apologised in the most fulsome of ways, and the members of the opposition know it. The members of the opposition know that he is genuine and sincere in his apology. His regret at saying what he did is plain and obvious to all. And um, the hypocrisy, there's no other word for it, and it's a word employ employed by Mark Latham on countless occasions by the Labor Party when they tolerated the worst possible standards from within their own ranks and, in fact, rewarded the purveyor of those low standards is breathtaking. It is simply unacceptable for the Labor Party, in a sanctimonious way, to, to assume such a, a shroud of superiority and of such morality when they, quite frankly, uh, will never come to the dispatch box or rise in their place and apologise for their insults. They play their politics hard and rough and uh, give no quarter and in most cases ask no quarter, whereas the Minister for Health and Ageing deeply regrets what he said, the context of it, and has made that perfectly plain to the public and to this House, and has therefore lived up to the requirements and responsibilities of his high office. Now, quite frankly, the, member for, the Minister for Health and Ageing is respected across party lines in this House as an honourable and decent human being. He has said to this House he's far from perfect. He's stating the obvious human condition, naturally, but there's no doubt that the, member, the Minister for Health and Ageing has holds, uh, many people hold him in the highest of regard. Uh, those of us who work with him uh, know of his idealism as, as well as his energy and his commitment to public life and, and the ideals of public office. When he falls short of them, as all of us do from time to time, uh, he has no hesitation in acknowledging his failings, faults and shortcomings. And in this, on this particular day, in regard to this particular instance, he has apologised fully and properly as he ought. And moreover, um, he, he accepts the criticism that others will make of him. But there has to be a line drawn here. And the Labor Party knows it, and, it, and the Labor Party, of course, has crossed that line. So until the Labor Party, and particularly the member for Lawler, being sanctimonious and lecturing from on high, can stand up and say she dissociates herself, she apologises and regrets her support for Mark Latham, given his, his personal demonising of a great many people. And, and where do I start? Where do I start? We have several pages. What about? 
what, 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 what about Kerry Packard? Do you agree? Do you agree with what Mark Latham, your former leader, whom, whom the member for Lawler more than Order. anybody else, put into the position of leader of opposition to help keep him there? When on uh, in in the Hansard, or, these are always in the Hansard, of course, with the protection for, of privilege. On the 24th of November 1999. Kerry Packer would have been guilty of tax fraud numerous times in the 1980s. He has had more tax schemes than I've had hot lunches, and then he goes on and on. I illustrate the point. The member for Lawler and those around her not only tolerated, not only tolerated Mark Latham's excesses, uh, never apologised for it, never required him to apologise for it, but then voted him leader of their party. That was the standard they aspired to. That's what they endorsed. That's what they embraced. And, and thankfully, the Australian people saw through the, uh, the bother boy and bullying approach and standards that Mr Latham and his party brought to public life. Mr Speaker, the, the Minister for uh, Health and Ageing is an imperfect person. Is there anybody here who is not? He recognises his faults, he's apologised for them, and that will be accepted and understood by, pe by any person of goodwill. There, most certainly you can quote members of the public who are disappointed and censorous of the minister's comments, as he is his, himself. And uh, all of us will learn from such intemperate remarks. But there has to come a point where people have, need to see the politics being played on this by the Australian Labor Party. And it's a pity that on a day when the Minister for Health and Ageing, in discharging his responsibility so admirably as, as an outstanding Minister for Health, has announced uh, the uh, highest level of GP bulk billing in country areas as a percentage of services bulk bill uh, that the Labor Party uh, personalises his role. Uh, for my own electorate of Gippsland, just to be a little bit parochial and, and, and selfish here, uh, Gippsland has increased over the last 12 months from 64.6 per cent of uh, services bulk billed to, wait for it, 76.3 per cent, an increase of 11.7 per cent. And overall, the nation's GP bulk billing rate has reached almost 75 per cent. And much of that is due entirely to the minister's work with his staff and with the department, enlisting the support of the government. He's been innovative and, um, and adventurous in his reforms of Medicare, and that has brought about tangible, real benefits to Australians. So, Whatever failings the minister has, as, and as he has said, it is a severe failing on this occasion. His work in holding, in, in living up to the, to the requirements and ideals of his office is entirely admirable. We thank the Minister for Health and Ageing for all the energy and enthusiasm he brings to the government. Uh, he is an inspiration for those of us who work closely with him, because whatever his faults and flaws, and again I stress, who don't we work with closely that we can't identify faults and flaws? His strengths, his abilities serve this nation well, and it is over the top for the Labor Party to call for his resignation. The Labor Party, like his own colleagues and the public, are, are perfectly within their rights and indeed are entitled to call for his apology, to be convinced of its veracity, but having done so, he needs to get back to work because the work he's doing on behalf of the Australian community is invaluable. There's a great deal more he has done in the interests of his constituency and the Australian community than any on the Labor Party side could ever lay claim to. I was rather amused by a number of comments to leave the opposition, but if I can just seize on one. For some reason, he went down the path of branch stacking. A, the, a, Labor part, a Labor Party leader talking about branch stacking as if somehow our branch stacking is worse than their branch stacking. To the, it's, it's just an absurdity. In fact, he said the Labor Party, under Labor Party rules, you can't stack a whole branch. Well, tell the member for Maranon that. Tell the member for Carayo that. Tell the member for Hotham that. All three who are, are certain or very likely to lose their seats to branch stackers. Um, in, the, in the case of the member for Carayo and the member for Maribyrnong, they're both front benches. When's the leader of the opposition going to show some strength? When's the Leader of the Opposition going to tell the factional warlords who are stacking the branches, which he's conceded, by the way, he told the world that, you, that, that there is branch stacking going on in the Labor Party, as if he could deny it. When's he going to tell them, hands off my front benches? When's he going to show some leadership, some strength? 
When is he going to stand by his uh, performing shadow ministers? Mind you, they haven't much chance to perform, but I think they're, I, I think they're more performing than the alternatives. And, and there are several others. There are several others from Victoria sitting quietly, hoping, hoping not to notice the order. attention of the order. branch the, stackers. Um, Minister, resume his seat. The member for Lowe on a well, point of order. Relevance to the motion before the chair, the Mr. Mr. Member Speaker. Lowe, resume ask, his seat. The member for Lowe, resume his seat. This is a, this is a, this is a censure motion. A wide-ranging debate has already occurred. The minister is in order. Well, the minister well, Mr. Deputy, Mr. Speaker, there's a point of order for me talking about talking about branch stacking when the leader of the opposition introduced it into the debate. So, so I, I think that. I think the, the, the Labor Party should get its lines right here. So, there are, so, the, so the Leader of the Opposition wandered down a road of branch stacking and, uh, and in doing so entrapped himself in the Byzantine politics of Victoria especially. Not that other states are immune from Labor Party standover tactics and, uh, and factional warfare. So I ask the Leader of the Opposition, of all of the most important issues to a number of his colleagues, surely their survival, particularly on their, uh, their performance, is ranks above everything else. When is he going to defend them? When is the spotlight going to be put on the Leader of the Opposition? He comes in here uh, with confected rage, and, but then, and then introduces a new topic into the uh, censure motion, but fails to follow through. Well, I'll follow through for him. Stand up for your colleagues. That's the test of leadership. That's the measure of loyalty, um, Mr. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the, the Minister for Health and Ageing is above all else a man of ideas, and the Labor Party deeply resents that. The Labor Party will always tackle will always tackle the the warriors in the Liberal and National parties. The, the Labor Party, I've noticed in my two decades in this place, will always single out those who are most effective and those whom they most fear. It doesn't matter if it was uh, Ian Sinclair or the Prime Minister in past days or, or Doug Anthony it's, or Tony Staley. It's always, they will always target a person and never give up Till they trash their reputation, till they diminish their standing, and they and they won't succeed on this occasion, and they haven't succeeded in the past because they always go too far. They always personalise it. They always reveal their particular demons, because in this way the Labor Party believes they can they can uh, derive energy, they can derive motivation from attacking individuals. But in this case, it's obvious to any fair-minded person in this place or outside this place that the Labor Party has overplayed its hand. The, the Minister for Health and Ageing has not attempted to excuse or, or talk away his comments. He has faced up to them, has accepted the censure of the general public and his colleagues. He has apologised as strongly as anybody can do so. And in doing so, and in doing so uh, he can move forward to fulfil his responsibilities and his tasks as a minister as strongly and as fervently as he, as he has in the, in the future as he has in the past. The question is that the motion moved by the Leader of the Opposition, opposition be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the noes have it. Ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Lock the doors. The question is that this House censure the Minister for Health and Ageing for failing to resign after making cruel and callous remarks following the suicide attempt of the former Leader of the Opposition in New South Wales, remarks that demonstrate the Minister's complete incapacity to provide any leadership on mental health issues. I put the honourable members for Melbourne Ports and Shortland tell us for the eyes, and the honourable members for Karangamite and Mallee tell us for the nose.
Order. The result of the division is ayes 56, noes 84. The question is therefore resolved in the negative. <laughs> the Honourable the Prime Minister. I ask that further questions be placed on the notice paper. The Honourable the Leader of the Opposition.